you know, we don't know that much about the early adoption of gold because it was so long ago, but at least with the discovery of oil, also known as black gold, right, that changed the economic prominence of whole countries and regions on a global global scale because it made them immensely wealthy. You know, thinking like, you know, the the countries with major oil reserves. Um and so with digital gold, you you it seems reasonable that countries that aggressively adopted um sovereign Bitcoin mining that were rich in, you know, abundant low cost energy reserves like huge excesses in hydro or geothermal or made a kind of a sovereign initiative to develop that to use use bitcoin's um monetary loop to expand their power production mine bitcoin and polish it with companies or what have you it it could change their standing in the world and i think it really could you know and so we'll see that might even work out for el salvador because they seem to be effectively the the forefront of that. This episode of Bitcoin People proudly brought to you by BitRefill, your one-stop shop for living on Bitcoin and Lightning and building out the Bitcoin economy and this Bitcoin world we would all love to see come to fruition. They've got all the best gift cards like Amazon, Apple, Bunnings, Airbnb, Uber and much more. They've got Coles and Woolies for your groceries, bill fairies to pay your bills, BP and Ampol for your petrol. You can do your hotel bookings or top up your phone credit or buy a gift or phone credit for a friend or loved one overseas. So check them out today, bitrefill.com and remember to put Bitcoin people in the referral code for 10% Bitcoin back on your first purchase. Incredibly honoured and privileged to have with me today, Dr. Adam Back, OG, cypherpunk and CEO of Blockstream. Welcome aboard to Bitcoin people, Adam. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It is so great to have you here. I started this podcast because I wanted to get a sense of the community and the values of the community and the person, as it were, behind the persona. And so I'd love to kick off by understanding a little bit about your upbringing and something to do with the values that you grew up with and if they changed and evolved over the years? Um, I'm probably somebody who's fairly constant in terms of outlook, you know, looking at things I wrote on the cypherpunks list in kind of mid-90s. Most of it looks like I kind of wrote it yesterday kind of thing. Um, so sort of mission-oriented uh, outlook, you know, f figure out something that is interesting and then kind of one-track mind trying to follow that through kind of thing. So I got on interested in, you know, PGP, which came out when I was a university student and then found the Cypherpunks list as somewhere where people were talking about similar things or privacy online, and of course, electronic cash, you know, before uh, DigiCash and DigiCash came out uh, sometime around then. And then, you know, the attempts to create a more decentralized electronic cash. Um, when DigiCash failed, the lesson that people drew from that was that the problem was it was centralized and it's operated by one company. Did your, we'll work through the kind of, obviously the solution to that that came to be, uh, and Bitcoin as it now is. Did you as a kid, you're fundamentally a historical figure now, you have changed the world. You've been a major name in the formation of Bitcoin, which is, uh, which is, which has never existed before. Nothing like it has ever existed before. Did you imagine when you were a kid that you were going to change the world to this degree, that you were going to be part of a movement? Did you imagine big things for yourself? Um, not really. I was sort of interested in mathematics and science and uh, computer programming from fairly early. I had a computer when I was like 13, taught myself to program in basic and then a machine code on a Z80 CPU, which is a kind of 8-bit 
earlier generation CPU with not that much memory and uh, no hard drive, like a tape drive and stuff like that. So yeah, found that fun. So from there, take us a little bit through a potted history. I know a number of people have heard this already, but just kind of the potted history. I think you, you came in via, you were doing some cybersecurity and uh, putting in some uh, uh, some measures against DDoS attacks. Um, and so I understand that to be not dissimilar in some ways to Jameson Lop's background story. Did a few of you come in from that angle? Um, well, I think the sequence for me was I was um, still in university for the most part. So I'd done a bit of consulting work. And so I was, um, you know, with the cypherpunks, they were interested in privacy. So there was this, uh, well, it still is, this system called anonymous remailers, which is a way to have privacy for email, for posting to Usenet discussion groups, which are kind of email-like discussion forum that's broadcast and there are different groups and different topics. And thousands of uh, servers around the world um, you know, universities or ISPs operate them, and then you can go on there and read and post. And um, <clears throat> the remailers were a way to participate in email, mailing lists, and using it anonymously. And the way it would work is you would um, sort of use some software, and instead of sending a mail directly or posting directly, you'd sort of encrypt it multiple, ta- multiple times, once for each hop in a remailer network. And so you'd send it off to the first remailer, it would open the first encryption envelope and see instructions to send it to another one with another encrypted message inside it. And it would keep going through the chain and eventually it gets to one that would say, post this to, you know, using it discussion about some topic or post it to a given email address. And so this is the way that people in- sort of achieve email related privacy. and. The the remailers themselves are operated by volunteers. You know, there's there's no kind of uh, way to charge a fee for it at, at the time because there was no electronic cash, which is kind of the problem, right? And so, what 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 seemed to be happening is people would spam through it. So, particularly to using it, that's a bit of a problem because it creates an amplification. You know, somebody can send one message through the remailer network, and then it will get sent to, you know, maybe 5,000 Usenet servers <laughs> around the world. And it wasn't even commercial spam, you know, advertising something. It was just kind of random noise, you know, it just looked like sort of a waste. Wa- and trying to, I guess, because it didn't have any, didn't seem to have any meaning, was that it was intended to annoy the operators of the Usenet forums who would be, you know, system administrators at universities and companies and ISPs and stuff, and uh, trying to create a backlash where they would block the remailers out of annoyance on a part of somebody who didn't like privacy online or something. That was a guess. <laughs> anyway, the people who operate the remailers, you know, it was something we were discussing on the side points list, and it was a little bit of a nuisance or potential risk of this blowback. So I started to think about um, what you could do to combat this kind of spam. Um, And so normally what people have done before that, uh, ISPs that operate mail servers, was to sort of work amongst the main mail providers and people operating mail servers to sort of cross report to each other like, you know, this IP address is sending a lot of spam and then they block block it or this domain or this email address is sending spam and they block it. And so the uh, challenge with the remailer is that by design, you don't know who's sending it and you don't know their IP address, so you can't block it. And so I had to find another solution. And that's where I came up with the uh, sort of proof of work based postage stamp, which I called Hashcash. Which was back in 1997. So a couple of things about that. Just before I ask a little bit more about Hashcash and then the evolution into kind of Bitcoin from there, there are a couple of different 
groups going on online. There was the cryptography groups and there was the cypherpunk groups. And I've, I'm have i not sure, it, it seems to me that the cypherpunks were more coming from the angle of libertarianism. So there was kind of the the political angle on that, whereas the cryptographers appear to be much more just interested in the technology side of it. Were you much interested in the libertarian angle or not especially? Um, I mean, I think there were a few, you know, there's there somewhat variety of views, probably not dissimilar to Bitcoin, which is, you know, some of the technologies have have a use for people who are, you know, engaged in different aspects of society or have different concerns, right? Some somebody might be a peace activist and, you know, having talked with Bill Zimmerman and seen him on stage at a recent conference, that that was where he got into got this kind of technology. And others would be, you know, more crypto anarchists or anarcho anarcho capitalism, which is I don't know if it's necessarily Entire, I you know, I don't, I don't really like follow labels too much. So I, I just figure on any given topic, you should, you should research and form your own opinion. So anyway, I, I like free markets, and so less government and anarcho capitalism appeals to me. And there's certainly people with that outlook. But you know, what, what, among the people on the Slackpunks list uh, was uh, Julian Assange. Actually, he'd uh, implemented a. Um, encrypted file system. So the slack points are all about implementing things. You know, you'd have ideas and people would be talking about, you know, geopolitics or encryption regulations, because some countries banned but uh, encryption at different times. Um and other people would say, well enough of all this political talk, that's never going to achieve anything. You know, lobbying, arguing about politics, never mind, let's just build some solutions and see if we can get people to use it. And so that was really the cypherpunks write code angle, which is that, you know, arguably through history, things have changed because de facto what people are doing, you know, what they expect, what they think is fair, technology they use is the real world. And then regulators and governments and policy and laws catch up like 50 or 100 years later by some test cases. So. That was, you know, generally people's outlook, and um, yeah. So going back to 1997, so there's this kind of blend of kind of political researching and understanding and, and insight from those forums and your own kind of research and, and interest, and you're going about finding solutions and you come up with hash cash. Did you at that point in time foresee, that's 25 years ago now, did you foresee, did you imagine the Bitcoin as we now see it and the impact that it would have on society and how it could disrupt uh, the world and the financial and governmental institutions as we have them? Well, um, the the Cypunks were certainly interested in building an electronic cash system. And they'd been, you know, that was the kind of holy grail, sort of most strategically interesting technology that, you know, that they were interested to see built, right? And some of the things where people on the list were able to build, like remailers, ultimately things like Tor that came before Tor, encrypted okay. file systems, all this kind of stuff, right? But electronic cash style, it's be harder. And DigiCash did get created, but it was, and it, and it had extremely strong privacy. It, it, effectively, it was what we would today call a stable coin because it was sort of that company was uh, trying to get a you know a bank account to receive transfers from users, swap your bank balance for electronic coins. You could spend those with a high degree of privacy, and then you you cash them out and take a tra- you know transfer money out of this bank account. So that was their idea. But um, when that, and, and the Cypunks like very interested in that, a number of people worked for DigiCash who were on the list, who were a bit older. Um, it, was, it was operated from the Netherlands. It was started by David Chorn, who's uh, oh. still actually been in space and was uh, one of the authors of the very early 
electronic cash, like academic papers. It was, it was originally an academic. So I think in 1985, he published his, around there, his blind signatures paper, which was uh, a way to have extremely strong privacy, but only with a central server. And so that's what, you know, the company started implementing. And so um, then, you know, in terms of working out how to implement it, I think, you know, the Cypunk spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to make a decentralized replacement when it failed, because it was a, you know, a promising and exciting technology and, it, and, you know, people on the list had high hopes that Digicash could do something like Bitcoin, right? At least in the privacy sense, though not in the asset class investment sense, right? Because it was just a stable coin in terms of value proposition. So um, I think, you know, people had high hopes for the sort of geopolitical importance of better electronic cash and smart contracts and things like that, but it turned out to be difficult to do. And so well, hash cash ended up, you know, being proposed, released in 1997, and that wasn't so long after DigiCash had run into this problem. As people are looking around for, you know, identif- trying to categorize what went wrong and think in the abstract about what you might need to do to fix that, to make it, you know, outlive one company to be more decentralized. And so when I posted Hashcash, it seemed to occur to multiple people within, you know, straight away, basically like within the next few days that, well, you know, one one difficulty with the DigiCash approach is that company needs a bank account and maybe the banks won't like, you mm. know, won't want to support this type of uh, use case rate. Right? And so Hashcash looks like digital gold, you know, there's there's some mining activity, you end up with something that's digitally scarce, and maybe this is part of the solution, that you could mine the coins and you could buy them by using electricity. And that could avoid needing a banking relationship, and then the rest of it could be free market. So I think ultimately that thought process, and there were discussions in 1997 about this, eventually by 1998, 1998, there were two proposals that were sort of broadly similar, which was Weidai's B Money and Nick Sabo's Bitgold, which were about about this, you know, sketches of how you might build a system using the proof of work, but bringing the other parts of it in. You know, you need a, a double spend database. It has to have some coordination mechanism because it's on the open internet, can't be any central servers, and you have to. Um, decide on some sort of supply or inflation control mechanism. Well, that was people's assumption because if you, you know, if you could run a piece of software on a computer or, you know, buy a, a computer that's optimized for the task and it prints money um, and the value of the electronic money is more than the cost of mining it, people will go nuts and you'll get hyperinflation or something, right? So that was the, I think, one of the central problems People were trying to find a solution to, and you know, Bitcoin and B Money have kind of out sketches or outline solutions of how you might do that, but they involve quite a bit of human judgment. You know, like a committee of people deciding, in the case of B Money, how many coin, you know, how much work it requires this month to make a coin, and next month they'll decide and say. It's almost like a monetary policy committee, right? They can decide maybe how many coins and how much work. And you hope they have good judgment, but that's sort of too similar to the current status quo, right? Yeah. And Nick Sabo's approach with B- with Bitgold was saying uh, a bit more market set, but still involving specialist human traders. So his idea was you just let people run with it, make as many stamps as they want in any given period. And then, if a lot, and then you'd have stamps with different rarities, so you know different ones that would be harder to make that you would find less of, and more common ones. And so the task of this specialist market maker was to assemble uh, a book of, a kind of virtual book of postage stamps, and assemble them into a standardized value. And that stamp book would be your uh, electronic coin. And I think it has an analogy in in a physical stamp, you know, postal stamp collector's yeah. world, which is you, you apparently can buy such books, and they are assembled by people who have an idea of 
you know what what the scarcity and value of stamps is, right? So yeah. that's what that car idea came in. But it's it's like you know how do you place a value on these postage stamps, and you know how do you compare the scarcity and the value? So it was a bit too all of it was a bit too vague, and so none of it got implemented. I think if people had come up with you know a clear and decentralized and convincing story. People that were into implementing things would have rushed off and implemented it already in 1998, but there were gaps, right? And so that didn't get implemented. And then later, how Finney in 2004 implemented uh, another system, which was centralized, but using trustworthy computing, which was a new kind of um, hardware add on for CPUs that gave you a signature to tell anybody on the internet what software the server was running. And so the idea is you would have a bit of improved trust in what the server's doing, because normally you have no idea what the server's doing. You know, is it well, cheating? Is it running this software? So with this added security, then he operated a, a Chom server, so similar technology to the Digicash server. But the way that you got coins is you sent it uh, a hash cash stamp and it would send you back a Chorn electronic cash token, which then you could respend. And this kind of trustworthy computing security setup would give you some assurance that it wouldn't cheat. And um, mm -hmm. so that that was like as far as it got um, in terms of technology, figuring out how to do things. You know, people tried a lot of things, a lot of discussion. And Aaron Van Weerden has uh, kind of bit, done a bit of. Uh, Bitcoin historian work and dug through all those kind of, I don't know, 95 to 2005 forum posts to see pre Bitcoin discussions that sounded like they were getting closer in the same same zone, same area. And um, read a, I just read a book about it, which I think is coming out soon. So then, you know, scroll forward to 2008 and it, Satoshi Nakamoto starts emailing people um, drafts of his paper and you know publishes the paper in and then the source code launches the network in January 2009 and it becomes clear that he's solved the really problem right so unlike the cypherpunks he didn't kind of post about it beforehand and discuss it but he implemented it and then released it right so there's not really much kind of pre-release discussion or brainstorming, right? He, he just kind of went off by himself and did it, apparently. Was there a set, was there a major like light bulb? Was there, what was the feeling amongst the cypherpunk community at that point as it was immediately released and everybody started to wrap their heads around what it was and what he'd done? He showed um, that. Yeah, I mean, it didn't it didn't receive as good a reception as you might hope, actually. Right. But um, there was there was some discussion, like fairly immediately, actually on a cryptography list. He posted it on that list and not the Cypherpunks list for some reason. And yeah. right. you know, um, they it, they were just analyzing it and you know pointing out limitations, like well, that might be hard to scale. A uh, common one was it doesn't look very secure because in the Digicash central systems, it's based on digital signatures. And if you trust the server, then it's almost impossible to, you know, roll back the system or cheat in any way. Whereas because Bitcoin is decentralized and there is no central server, the way that the sort of the system um, moves forward and, you know, processes blocks of transactions is is based on a proof of work. And so it's a kind of arms race between the good guys that want to, you know, process transactions and the bad guys that might want to, you know, take some money from a transaction and then undo it or something. And right. so I think it took people a while to get comfortable with this sort of relaxed security assumption. But, you know, in fairness, it was at least decentralized, which none of the other systems were, right? But there's was, there was a trade-off, you know, to get that decentralization, it seems 
you know, and people looked at this afterwards that it seems fairly, it seems like the only solution, right? There's no other candidate uh, way to do this in a decentralized way that doesn't involve this trade off. But once people saw that trade off spelled out and implemented, they were, you know, poking at, well, it's very different to the previous systems. And it took, you know, particularly the academics who'd written about electronic cash, I don't know, three or four years before they started to take it seriously, actually, because, you know, they were used to, um, you know, starting from the 1985 paper by David Chaum, there was a kind of increasingly clear specification of um, how an electronic cash system, you know, the the what properties it should have. And, you know, if oh, yeah. you're going to publish a paper, it should do what the previous ones do and improve something. And Bitcoin was like a rewrite. It's like, well, never mind all that stuff. You know, it doesn't have this blind signature privacy. It doesn't have sort of digital signature security on the progress, but you don't have to trust the central server. It's completely decentralized. Any party can like, you know, leave and the system carries on. So it's very survivable. So the reactions were a bit, you know, mixed. Uh, Hal Finney was somebody that, you know, he was one of the people that wrote code. So he wrote, implemented the, P- added PGP into the Remailer network to improve the security of it. Remind so me, PGP? When, privacy uh, something. Pre- yeah, pretty good privacy. So it was oh, pretty Phil good Zimmerman's, privacy, yes, of course. Yeah, yes, yes. Phil Zimmerman's um, kind of implementation of public key cryptography, which was, you know, kind of pretty interesting early tech that's still around to this day, um, but email encryption mostly. Um, so, so he was the implementer. And so, you know, when Bitcoin came out, and another thing he would do is, you know, read academic papers and then explain them. So like implement things, read things and explain them. So with, with Bitcoin, he tried it out, he installed it. Um, he uh, received, I think, the first transaction in Bitcoin history, like from Satoshi, a kind of demo, you know, transaction. Um, people could find it online. I think it was like 10 Bitcoin out of block nine, maybe. And um, then he wrote about it, you know, so he wrote, he wrote a summary on the list about how it works, you know, what, what Bitcoin was about, roughly how it worked to help people understand. And, um, and he later wrote about, you know, what he did, he, he mined for a while on a laptop and then it got noisy and he turned it off and, you know, um, so at least that, that was the kind of early reaction. And you know, my reaction, because I'd implemented some open source software on to implement a couple of electronic cash systems in a library and worked at sort of privacy tech startups that had implemented some of the previous electronic cash systems, was that it wasn't as um, private as, as the previous systems. But right. you know, I came from a distributed systems background. That's why I was studying at university. And... So I thought, well, at least he solved the decentralization problem, right? So it is it is a move forward in one direction and a step back in another direction. And so, you know, the main question mark for me was, um, you know, in terms of adoption is, will it bootstrap? Will it get enough users to, you know, maintain continuous interest to develop right. a price to get used for actual value? And... So I just kind of, well, let's let's see, you know, I was busy with a startup and I was just like, you know, watch the news for progress, right? And I'm not sure exactly how long that took, but I think it was a few years before there was like, you know, an exchange that even had a listing, right? But before that, there was no way to buy or sell Bitcoin other than, you know, to mine them or try to negotiate with somebody, you know, to send them, send them money somehow. And then, and then, you know, swapping coins for things like the, the pizza experiment, right? So, yeah. Which happened on my birthday, as it turns out. Um, not my actual birthday, but my, I was, I had been born some time ago, but on the anniversary of my birthday, does it work? My birth date. Um, so tell me, you've talked about Bitcoin as being a discovery. I've got a couple of thoughts about that. What does the it, was it inevitable? Do you do you look at the way that um, that 
computer science was going and think it had to happen sometime? And also, does it matter whether it's a discovery or an invention? What What's the impact there? So it's a double-barreled question about um, about this idea of it being a discovery. Um, I think it's better as a discovery because inventions tend to be a bit proprietary or particularly if they're developed yeah. by a company or if there's a personality that you know developed it developed the original uh idea or what have you right and so um i mean clearly what what would help bitcoin being sort of a discovery i thought well is is that Satoshi disappeared after a while like said something and stepped back from participating in the forums but the other thing that makes me think about as a discovery is um you know, I think it was in 2013, I got kind of a lot more actively interested. I, it seems to me that yeah. Bitcoin had bootstrap, like, you know, they were exchanging as people were <clears throat> developing it, starting to use it. So I got a kind of renewed interest and in, went to try and understand the next level of detail. And at that time, I spent like three or four months trying to figure out, well, you know, there are some limitations of Bitcoin maybe with my background in electronic cash and distributed systems i can figure out some way to improve something about it like improve the privacy or something and um or other aspects of it right and to my surprise it was like basically impossible to improve it you know if you if you would make one thing better it would make a couple of other things worse and so you know that's that's not what you expect with new technology and you see you see a lot of people expressing doubt that oh you know it's the first version you know they'll think about like the wright brothers airplane or model t ford or something like you know that, that we can yeah. do much better but actually you know i don't i don't think we can <laughs> and it's because it's a kind of low level sort of tightly defined thing and the the sort of design parameters that that make it work are in a very narrow area. You know, you change much and it stops working, or it, you know, it gets worse, and then you change it much more, it stops working. And so that that seems more like a discovery, right? You know, so you've got very fundamental things that haven't changed for hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands of years, like I don't know, discovery of gold as a, a yeah. scarce commodity, or discovery of DNA, which turns out all life is using that. Um, or like mathematical things that are taught in high school, you know, like Pythagoras theorem or something. It's like we're going to make a better Pythagoras theorem. It just is, right? And it's um, so. Of course, you can change kind of. You know, there are lots of parameters in Bitcoin, and some of them people will say, "Well, you know, why why twenty one million coins went up forty two million? It's like, sure, okay, we'd be trading in half Bitcoins. Probably that wouldn't change much, right?" And some of the other parameters presently can change them a little bit. So that's, but I think those are sort of equivalent, but the the sort of fundamental behavior of it that you spend energy with electricity to create scarce respendable coins in the decentralized system, that seems like a fundamental discovery, right? And really like digital cash, I think is a good way to think about it because yeah, Nick Sabo actually had written a number of blog posts about a history of money and how different earlier societies had tried to use different technology kind of or artifacts as money. So just things with scarcity, okay. right? So it seems like a recurring thought process for early humans in different civilizations to want to figure out something that's scarce and then use it as a unit of exchange and store of value. And so... You know they're improving the technology as they discover new things. You know how to how to refine gold, things they had before that, and when they find a better one, they switch to it and they use it for a long time. And so it seems like Bitcoin is a better gold. Basically, it's, it's a, a gold, and and some things are, you know, with that, with digital computers, some things become possible to do more efficiently than 
with just physical uh, commodities or you know even mechanical yeah. things like you know a combustion engine well you, it turns out you can do better if you've got a computer because you can you know map the engine and that's going to always be an increment more efficient than some kind of analog device with spinning gears and centrifuges in it so like you know trying trying to achieve a certain efficiency curve Dig digital things are more flexible and so you know i guess we reached the limit of physical gold thousands of years ago right there wasn't a better scarcer prop metal with better physical properties and so that's stuck but now that we have the digital so maybe it is somewhat inevitable in that you should be able to get on a way to produce a digital version and you know that there's there's a quote from um some uh, famous economist about that uh oh uh i know who you're thinking about and it's about uh, about um, not fighting them but but create a better technology build something that's the better. one is that what you're thinking of yeah well, we can find it and maybe put it in the notes or something. But yeah, there's, there's a video of this uh, fellow describing it on, on an interview. You know, it, it's it's up to the, it's like early internet times. And he's saying that, you know, maybe, you know, we can in a roundabout way find some technology that takes the creation of money out of government's hands or something like that. And something about internet money as well. So, so it right. seemed to have occurred to people in the abstract that it might be possible, yes. right, in a, in a kind of technology hopeful way. And, you know, certainly the cypherpunks, you know, thought it might be possible because they spent a lot of effort trying to concretely figure out how to do it, right? So, yeah, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, at least in the concept terms, it seems, you know, it seems plausible that it should be possible. Um, even Absolutely. at the time of DigiCash, yeah. Are you or your loved ones looking to secure and manage your Bitcoin with confidence? The Bitcoin Advisor is your premier destination for professional Bitcoin management, helping you buy, secure and manage your Bitcoin so you can own intergenerational wealth and sleep easy. With a reputation built on unparalleled security, strategic planning and comprehensive client education, the Bitcoin Advisor team have managed over $1 billion in assets without losing a single Satoshi since 2016. Whether you're new to Bitcoin or a seasoned investor, the Bitcoin Advisor team are there to guide you every step of the way. So please click on the link below to organize yourself a consultation and include the name Carrie, C-A-R-R-I, in the referral code so that they know that I've sent you their way. So let's just come back to impact the impact of this discovery has it had the impact to date that you would imagine and what do you imagine the impact going forward of this discovery so so you've seen this thing evolve from say 25 years ago in the forums to coming to market in let's say the white paper 2008 the first block 2009 then you've got you know, a number of years of people coming to terms with it, including yourself, and and you know, trying to improve it and work out that that it's not improvable. From and there we are. So let's say that's 2013 when you you kind of worked that out for yourself, or that you were playing with those ideas. And so we're now exactly 10 years from then. Has it? Did you have a view of what it would? of the impact it would have has it had that impact and what do you imagine from here um yeah i mean i think the vibe i went to a couple of the i mean to the first bitcoin conferences i'd been to in 2013 and the vibe was similar but there's a lot smaller right so there were people that were very excited about the potential but you know there's a much narrower set of people who'd ever heard about bitcoin um and maybe a narrower set of backgrounds to to have come across it, you know, from a technology background or from a use case background, um, or just just an early early adopter of novel technology kind of people as well. Yeah. Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's maybe you see a kind of phenomena with um, sort of technology evangelists, sometimes science fiction writers um, or futurists who, you know, who try to project what what the ultimate implication of this technology might be. And um, I think Bitcoin has a potentially very wide impact. And of course, it's come a long way since then, you know, the, at the time, there were very few banks that were interested in hearing about Bitcoin. You know, they, they didn't, well, in many cases, I think they just really didn't want to hear about it. And then there was a period where they were interested in blockchains, but not Bitcoin. And now they're like, you know, in a race, at least in the US, to provide Bitcoin related services in the form of an ETF or other Bitcoin related services to a savings technology or a publicly traded exchange traded fund or, you know, just different products to wealth management clients and other, you know, general investors in the public. Um, so it's really come full circle. And of course, I think the other thing is it tends to, from my perspective, to happen faster than you'd think. You know, 10 years is a long time, but, you know, I think in 2013, things have happened now that people didn't think would happen. Like they thought it might not happen or that they thought. Such as? Can you give me well, an Well, I mean, like governments um, with, you know, mining Bitcoin or with buying Bitcoin or public market companies and, you know, the the uh, sort of recognition of Bitcoin uh, by regulators and, you know, the advent of like um, sort of yeah. presidential elections with candidates that are in favor of Bitcoin and using it as an election topic or something, right? It's not, not something you would expect to see that soon or maybe ever, right? I mean, I think in 2013, people were a bit nervous that governments would really not like Bitcoin and try to do what some of them did, you know, did for a while with encryption, which is to ban it, right? Like to ban the export well, of it or to ban the use of it in, in some countries. Now, typically... You know, this is in the 90s with the so-called encryption wars on a, on a sort of policy war. Now, typically, the countries that would out, try to outright ban encryption would be ones with, you know, uh, bad human rights records and not, not very good rule of law or something. But still, there were major countries that were, you know, trying to discourage commercial and individual use of encryption. So there's a bit of a open question about how how Bitcoin would navigate the regulation landscape without getting like attacked by regulators. And that you know, somehow that by organic no. growth and being of interest to a wide segment of society, including politicians and diplomats and you know, any, anybody really, right? So there's a really a very wide range of people that become interested and um, so I think that helps, and I think it's also viewed kind of like a technology wave, right? So at least in some countries, there was a concept mm -hmm. of not sort of smothering, promising new technologies in regulation because you might hold back your country's um, economic relevance in that kind of technology wave. And technology waves sometimes bring kind of prosperity and employment and financial opportunity to a country. So. And indeed, like that's that's a, a prospect that some countries will adopt more aggressively and earlier, like uh -huh. what El Salvador is trying to do. So awesome. I think it's, um, and you know, in terms of it being a very long arc discovery, you you could, I try to make the argument that, you know, we don't know that much about the early adoption of gold because it was so long ago. But at least with the discovery of oil also known as black gold, right? Mm. That changed the economic prominence of whole countries and regions on a global mm. global scale because it made them immensely wealthy. I think in like, you know, the the countries with major oil reserves. Um and so with digital gold, you you it seems reasonable that 
countries that aggressively adopted um, sovereign Bitcoin mining that were rich in you know abundant low cost energy reserves like huge excesses in hydro or geothermal or made a kind of a sovereign initiative to develop that to use use Bitcoin's um, monetary loop to expand their power production, mine Bitcoin and polish it with companies or what have you, it it could change their standing in the world. And I think it really could, you know. And so we'll see that might even work out for El Salvador because they seem to be effectively the the forefront of that. So yeah, I think that kind of stuff tends to happen, has tended to happen faster with Bitcoin than, than we thought. And the other thing in terms of like the the eventual impact, I think you know the impact of the internet itself is more widespread than people guessed because the early internet had like you know email and FTP servers and their web servers and you know there are sort of infamous um, technologists and political comments about the internet oh you know it's just like a fax machine or nobody will use it and then you know but it seems like people were actually crediting the availability of, you know, instant messaging, social media, and the ability to communicate about geopolitical t- things that are going on, coordinate politically as factors in the overthrow of authoritarian regimes like the Arab Spring and things like that, right? So clearly just the ability to communicate has had major shifts in you know, the balance of power between the individual and the state. And so my thinking is if, if if just instant messaging, the ability to communicate and publish has that change, we haven't seen the end of uh, very electronic cash, right? The, the ability to separate money from states, people to opt out of uh, government controlled uh, Fiat money, which you know, which they can use to subsidize the sort of apparatus of the state, could be pretty big in the long term. And I think we haven't seen that, you know, haven't really seen that much of that play out yet. But we probably will. It's my guess. So I think it could be very um, impactful in the longer term, and in a positive way, in my view. Indeed, let's uh, let's talk about ETFs. Is well, there's a couple of things I want to talk about here, but let's just start with ETFs and your view on, you know, whether they're good or bad fundamentally for Bitcoin as part of this process. Yeah, I mean, in a in the past, I um, owned a little bit of gold ETF units, yeah, and. Relatedly, at the time that I bought those units, I had heard about, you know, read about in finance, what, what's written about finance, that you'd, you'd need to pay attention that the ETF you buy was physically backed. Like, you know, well, you each ounce of gold you would buy, that would actually be an ounce in a, in a gold depository, and right. you weren't buying some kind of synthetic or rehypothecated ETF. And so I did a research and like, Figured out one that seemed, people seem to be agreeing was physically backed and bought that. And so I think one concern with ETFs is that you end up with um, sort of more people with a financial claim on gold or Bitcoin than they were excess of the physical thing. And that's yep. therefore inflationary in effect. Um, so that's, that's one concern. I think that's um, a bit less likely with Bitcoin because you can take physical possession of it. I think that one of the challenges of gold is it's expensive and complicated to take physical possession. Um, and yeah, and I think the the ETFs that are under discussion in the US at the moment are spot ETFs, so they'll be required to keep their physical possession of the coins. So, and I think the other thing which is more specific to Bitcoin is that I mean, I, I guess it's sort of relevant for gold, you know, so in some countries people have physical gold or savings, like India, that's quite common. Um, yeah. And so there's a difference between 
gold in private physical possession and ownership and gold in the ETF. Um, but in Bitcoin, it's even more dramatic because the gold that you have, sorry, the, the digital gold, I, the, the Bitcoin that you have in a wallet with your own keys, it can't be seized and you can transact it and you have more privacy. And so in, in a lot of ways, the fundamental value of Bitcoin is the properties it has when you have your own, you know, have it in your own wallet. And the risk might be if too much of it ended up in ETFs where it's it's an IOU, it's a financial instrument, it could be seized by, you know, a government order. Um that the ETF managers might end up with too much kind of influence. If you imagine there's uh, you know, going back to the fork wars of twenty fifteen era, um if some huge percentage of Bitcoin was in ETFs, the fund mm. managers might feel they had a fiduciary or legal obligation to act in a certain way, you know, to support one type of fork outcome. And maybe, you know, we the Bitcoin users wouldn't agree, right? So yeah. I think that could be risky. And I mean, I do think Bitcoin could be successful like financially, even if it ended up you know, pretty much exclusively in an ET in ETF like vehicles because it's an interesting financial asset. But I think that loses a lot of what is interesting to the individual and, you know, the the sort of geopolitical positive impact of it, right? So I hope that doesn't happen. So I, th I hope that, you know, enough there's a bit of a balance so enough people keep it keep direct control of it. But yeah. you know, I think the the positive side effects of ETFs are that it, it enables people to own it who through a, you know, a better capitalized, probably more trustable custodian than, than, you know, the, the current sort of prop of, uh, exchanges and so on, which are really more for trading and less for long-term custody and have a worse risk profile probably because they're far less well capitalized, but it, it gives more people an access to it who don't feel comfortable with it, with the key backup and managing keys, which is a bit of an IT topic that you know is is easy to make mistakes. Um, oh. So, so that's positive. And I think the other thing that's potentially positive is that you know a lot of people have a form of savings in a pension fund or something like that, which is managed by fund managers, and those fund managers are allocating capital to bonds and stocks and things like that, right? Um, mm. And they can't, I, th I think on a regulatory basis, they're not allowed to buy physical Bitcoin because it's not in the category of things that they can buy. They can buy ETFs, right. but they can't, you know, create an exchange account and, right. and hold coins or hold coins physically just because the regulations that apply to them, right? So look after their, their pension money. And so I think giving those kind of mutual and pension funds access could indirectly help people, right? Um, mm. you know, some, some people kind of complain, it's like, you know, who, who maybe didn't do any investment. I think the average person doesn't do kind of directed investment, right? You know, they, they yeah. have a mortgage, they have a savings account, they, they don't like dig into this whole world. But um, so there, there's some people who will say, you know, why do we want these speculators buying Bitcoin anyway? Let's just use it, right? And I think the thing is, um, people who are not necessarily actively using Bitcoin, but see it being adopted and see that people, you know, a lot of people have a demand for it, will will want to sort of invest in that in that possible future, right? And so they'll either like it, if you look at it from an analog to the internet, they'll invest in the internet technology companies because you couldn't, you know, buy an internet. There was no internet gold that represented the yeah, internet right. being used. So they would buy, you know, Cisco stock or Google or, you know, Amazon, all these companies that were growing by building internet related equipment and services. And so that's that's the analog for Bitcoin. So it's I think it's yeah. like inevitable and it probably helps ultimately because there's a lot of technology that has to get built. And so you need financing for technology companies and service companies to build that. Um, so, and, and I think, you know, as a store of value, 
a higher value and a more stable price is is a use case too, right? It it makes it more usable um, yep. for more people, for more use cases. Fair call. A, a somewhat related question is around KYC. Have we lost uh, privacy forever with the ubiquitousness of KYC? Uh, do you see us being able to claw back privacy in any meaningful way? Um, well, I mean, I think that it is better if you can to get some Bitcoin that is not linked you know, to your bank account or to a transfer to an exchange. And there are, you know, some ways to do that. And I think it's useful to do that um, because, you know, Bitcoin that nobody knows you have is a better insurance policy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the financial system has kind of got over top heavy in terms of, you know, burdens on banks to get into people's business too much, you know, to ask for a lot of information about themselves. Now, of course, they're going to need some information about people because, you know, if somebody dies, they've got, you know, there's got to be some procedure to hand over the bank balance to their relatives or yeah. you know, if they lose their passwords, you've got to get back in. But, you know, apart from that, they've got a lot more of the board. And I don't think the banks necessarily like it. It's the government regulations, international regulations, because those are costs and friction to their business, right? So yes. I think the regulators are kind of gone over board. And that's, that. it wasn't always that way, right? It's some kind of pendulum swinging too far. So in a way, Bitcoin is sort of a technology-led pendulum swinging it back to, you know, a balance. And, the, you know, what people have got to bear in mind is that um, you know, all of the sort of bureaucrats and politicians and regulators, they're public servants. They work for civil society, i.e. us, right? And so if they are just creating a lot of senseless friction and red tape that's it's ultimately costing human progress and making, you know, life inconvenient and annoying for millions of people for no good reason, then it's time for them to, you know, think again and Stop doing it, right? So, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see any moral authority in like these kind of regulations, or even any particular like balance logic in it. It's just a kind of inertia of a pendulum swinging too far that needs to get improved. And you know, one one way things like that improve is people just start using other systems that don't have those pain points, and that's effectively what's happening today, right? Yeah, gotcha. Um, I want to tangent, if you don't mind, just a little bit about Blockstream. I've got a philosophical question for you. You uh, you come from a, a computer science background uh, and have been in the you know IT industry for many, many years now. Not everyone can make the transition to being an entrepreneur, to being a businessman. You were an invest you were an investor before this. You were a day trader, uh, and you started Blockstream. Being an entrepreneur, is that innate? Does one have the the risk profile and the skills for being a businessman innately, or is that something that you had to learn along the way? And if so, what have you learned? Um, yeah, well, my, my parents were kind of some small business owners, self-employed, you know, they operate a hotel, they operate a few shops and, you know, in, and worked for companies in between, but you know, did their own accounts, financial projections. So I grew up with that kind of stuff going on, but also I think it's a question of what you enjoy if you tolerate risk and uncertainty. And so, you know, in the um, sort of, Late nineties, early two thousands, I worked for a startup that was in Montreal called Zero Knowledge yep. Systems, and they were trying to build a tour like technology, like uh, ability to browse the web anonymously. Mm-hmm. But this was a bit before Tor came out, and so you know, I actually found it quite interesting. You know, I before that I'd worked 
after finishing my PhD for a kind of um, medical uh, security, like the security for the IT systems around communicating medical records. <laughs> but it was sort of, you know, an R&D project partly funded by the European Union. And so I was a bit dissatisfied with the efficiency of use of capital, which was ultimately, you know, EU taxpayer money. So, so my view was like, wow, this is this is not good. I uh, I want to see a more free market, efficient use of capital. It doesn't sit right with me that, you know, effectively these guys are inefficiently using the public money. And so, yeah. you know, at least with uh, private industry, the the a startup is funded by investors who have a risk reward profile, right? And if they succeed, they make money. And if you know, they made a bad call, it might not work out. So, so I joined this venture funded startup called Zero Launch Systems. And of course the profile is very different from, you know, working for a big company where, you know, maybe there's, you know, a very nine to five atmosphere and not very high energy. People clock off at, at 5 PM and, uh, you know, where it's a startup and, and you've got to find job, right? Your job is to do this and it's a big company, but you know, in a startup world, it's like, you know, it starts with a, a few dozen people and you're like, okay, well, we need some office furniture. So who's coming, you know, we'll go rent a van and go pick up some desks and computers and stuff, right? So it's really, you get to do a, a wide range of crazy things, right? Um, and it's not, you know, there's none of this, oh, it's not my job, but it's like, well, we have to do this, you know, let's work together and do it, right? So, but there's, there's a lot of uh, risk profile to doing that. And I've been through... You know, three different startups at this stage. Currently in the blo- you know in a blockstream startup, but that zero knowledge startup uh, then worked for Microsoft for a little while, and then dove straight into another startup. And then after that, that got bought by yeah. EMC, and then you know back into another startup. So I think the startup world is like more invigorating, high energy, and you feel like you can build something and achieve some change. And statistically, it's a recognized fact that big companies have difficulty innovating. The startups you know, do the innovation, and then, as in the case of that previous startup, they get bought by a bigger company as a way to bring some innovation into their into their company. Right. So, if you got the kind of risk tolerance, because because you know a lot of startups, um, you know, Blockstream hasn't done this because we've got a clear mission, and so our mission has like stayed constant through the company. It's been around since twenty fourteen, but. A lot of startups will sort of do a pivot, right? So they will, you know, they'll they'll have a product idea, they'll start building it, and then they'll decide uh, this doesn't look like it's going to sell, and they'll throw it away and build something else. And you know, for people in the company, it's kind of bewildering. It's like, well, what are we even doing here, right? Actually, companies that ended up being successful did a complete pivot, and like Slack is one of them, right? They were, I don't know, business yeah. was something completely unrelated. They built an internal chat system just coincidentally because they needed it and then that became the company and the actual products, you know, people have kind of forgotten what it was at this point, right? So that kind of head spinning, uncertainty, you know, fundraising ebbs and flows and the uh, the sort of struggles for startups to get traction and like, you know, the market is volatile too, right? You know, just the stock market, the amount of money people are spending in their sort of discretionary spending ability and economic down cycles. So it's a bit of a roller coaster. But if you if you enjoy that and I do, then it's just uh, much more fun, basically. And you and you feel like you can achieve some innovation in that in that format. So kind of a philosophical question here, but the uh once you've hit a, a point of some level of financial stability, security is is it harder to innovate from there or is it easier? Is it easier to be creative from a financially secure base or is necessity the mother of invention and do you need to be hungry? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question because, I because th- you know, as I said, the big companies, like public companies, you know, companies with tens of thousands of employees, it's a clear pattern that they have difficulty maintaining innovation, even though they started as a startup. And some companies have done better than others in in keeping that going. So I think mm-hmm. Google has a reasonably good reputation for keeping innovation going. 
Um, so, and I, and I mean, I suppose also, you know, people's kind of work ethic, right? Like if, if some of these big companies with tens of thousands of employees, you know, everybody, the office is empty at 5 PM sharp, right? Well, then they're not maybe as engaged or dedicated to They're not working as hard. They're not as focused on a mission so they can lose it. Right. So that's, yeah. that's the challenge they have. Um, yeah, and I do think you know constraints can get things to market faster, right? Because often, if you let developers and I'm, you know, I come from development background, you know, if you don't give them any parameters, they will just keep expanding the scope and then not not get it finished, right? So, in a startup setting, you are trying to, you know, release early and often, like make a first version, take feedback, improve it and iterate where, you know, probably big companies are more, you know, it takes them longer and they're more perfectionists. And so you know, part of what makes it hard for them to innovate is they're too bureaucratic and too slow. Fair call. Uh, I've got to ask you before we wrap up, what are we looking at on your whiteboard there in the background? What are you working uh, on? Um, so <laughs> some of it is some... Um, uh, cryptography. I mean, some of it's just numbers that I was like talking on the phone with somebody about, like interest rates or different things. Or when I'm doing a bit of um, trading related calculations. Uh, but some of it is um, attempts to optimize some um, cryptography. So there's uh, that was one of the things I figured out in 2013 that maybe there was a way to improve the privacy part of Bitcoin, uh, which was what came to be known as confidential transactions. And we actually implemented that in Liquid at Blockstream, which is a kind of Bitcoin layer two. So, and uh, and it's it has some trade off, you know, so there's no silver bullet for things in Bitcoin, right? Or Bitcoin mm-hmm. would already do them. So and the trade off is it's bigger, it takes more space. And so uh, I've, I try, in my spare time to to optimize that thing so there's some attempts at like figuring out how to do that intuitively i think it should be possible but it's one of these sort of elusive things where there's potentially some trick or insight that will get it the next step forward it's been a delight having you here do you have anything you would particularly like to either discuss or final words you would like to put out there to the universe, particularly for anyone who might be newer to Bitcoin? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one thing with Bitcoin that is interesting is for a lot of people, they learn by doing. So, you know, people will hear about it and it would just be an idea. But I think if you, you know, set up a wallet or you set up an account and you buy a little bit and you watch the price move and you, you know, succeed at doing the backup and a transaction and recovery from the backup, it gives you a more sort of hands-on feeling for how it works, right? And I think for a lot of people that is, you know, it's work because it's setting up and playing with IT stuff is, is not their thing. But it gives you a more, a better intuition for how it works and why it's interesting. So I encourage people to, you know, to uh, take the first step, basically. Um, That tends to uh, enthuse people to learn more. Absolutely fair call. And I think there is a theme that goes on in our community about not so much buy Bitcoin, but study Bitcoin. Bitcoin get involved, but also make that first transaction. Just get in, get off zero, uh, and yeah. start to start to play. And um, Adam, it has been a pleasure and a delight, and I am so privileged and honoured that you took the time to join us here today. Thank you. Be well, and good luck with all that you're doing. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. All the best. On the medium of exchange side of things, Bitcoin is only going to become more popular. 
It's an online currency that can be used in every, literally in every place on the planet. That's unprecedented. That is gonna to continue to have momentum. That momentum is gonna last several years. And then, you know, as a store of value, each time we have financial crisis or, uh, you know, a currency blow up somewhere around the world, or, you know, uh, bank failures, understanding Bitcoin as a store of value layer for the internet and for people culturally continues to improve. So I don't have to know when the next crisis is, um, but the instability itself justifies the thesis.